well done if you're still hanging in there ready for the fifth night of Aravinda Adiga's The White Tiger. All the earlier chapters should be um, available on my YouTube channel. Okay, thankfully, after that last chapter, this one's actually quite a short one. And it's actually interesting because it um, finishes quite abruptly as something happens. And Balram is called away from his um, letter that he's writing to Premier Jabal. So like I did with the previous video, I've just gone through and written up a summary of what happens in the chapter. I'll quickly run through that and then I'll read the chapter with discussion and highlighting of quotes. Okay, so the chapter actually launches straight into explaining one of the key concepts of the novel, the rooster coop. The idea of the rooster coop is that those at the bottom, the servants of India, do not rebel against the system. They are trustworthy with large amounts of money. They won't steal it. The entire economy of India rests on that idea and that servants will accept their situation no matter how appallingly they're treated. And Adiga or Balram suggests that you know the whole Indian economy rests on this idea of the rooster coop that keeps the servants under control. Why do they stay in the coop? Well, he, he goes on to explain that they are trapped in the coop because of the power of the Indian family, because breaking out of the coop, disobeying the rules, would involve sacrificing one's family. Balram himself uh, is quite clear that he is trapped in the coop himself. I've just changed the spelling of, of coop there. He's, um, Balram is uh, trapped in the coop as uh, he's contemplating prison, uh, but he doesn't rebel against it. So he sits down in the basement of Buckingham Towers number B, but doesn't run away or rebel, even as he's aware that his employers and grandmother are plotting to send him to prison. The story then uh, continues with what happens to Balram in that moment, and he describes being, you know, being called upstairs by his employers. He's extremely distressed by the prospect of going to prison and literally wets himself, urinates on himself through his terror at that time uh, as he's been called up to give the stork a massage. The um, family uh, don't, I'm, I'm getting into my analysis prematurely, so I'm going to quickly race through these points and I'll go back and I'll talk more about it as I read. The family don't tell Balram that he won't go to prison until Pinky insists that they do. She's clearly disgusted and disturbed by the situation. From there, the stork, he goes to a private hospital, which is used as a point of contrast to the public hospital that Balram's father, Vic Vikram, dies in. Then the stork and the mongoose head home on the train. Pinky then leaves Ashok. She's clearly been completely freaked out by the hit and run situation and the way that the family's dealt with it. She gives Balram some money on her way out the door. At the airport, literally. It's a lot of money to Balram, but it's not really a lot of money. It's under $100. Ashok is upset when ba um, Pinky leaves. He actually attacks Balram on a balcony after he finds out Balram took her to the airport. He nearly throws it, Balram off the balcony, and Balram ends up kicking him to save his own life. Ashok then falls into a drunken despair at Pinky's departure. Balram cares for him and comes to sort of see himself as important to Ashok. And for a time, Balram imagines that there's a real intimacy there between the two of them. He talks about feeling genuinely sorry for Ashok, but then he also knows he needs Ashok to be okay, um, for him himself to be okay. He's dependent on him. So he's not even sure in his own head whether he truly cares for him or not. And there's a discussion of his confusion over that point. Uh, in this chapter. Then the mongoose returns and uh, suddenly the intimacy that's grown between Balram and uh, Ashok just disappears. Uh, with him, the mongoose brings a letter from Balram's grandma, Kusum. She wants money from Balram and she's also um, asking that Balram marry. So the mongoose reads this, this letter out um, to Balram that Kusum has, has sent via him. Then the mongoose goes away again and Ashok hurries back to, uh, Balram hurries back to Ashok, who's washing his feet. Ashok and Balram rushes in and said, oh, sir, 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 I'll do that for you. And Ashok rudely dismisses him, tells him to get away from him. And uh, um, Balram leaves the room. 
Later on, he drives Ashok around town and sees the building construction sites of the area that they're in. He's looking at a, um, some asses, which are donkeys, working on a building site. And he sees a large one and a couple of smaller ones that are obviously children. And he realizes that he doesn't want to obey Kusum um, and that she's been blackmailing him by sending that letter through the mongoose and putting pressure on him. It's a, a veiled threat to um, expose him to his bosses if he doesn't send money and do what she wants. He also realizes that if he marries, he will be confining his own children to a life, life of servitude like the two donkeys he's looking at. He uh, questions um, then his drive to massage Ashok's feet um, and he sees that it, being a servant has been bred into him. Uh, he has a vision of his own mother's fate and he's thinking about does he want to be a father, does he want to raise you know, children who are going to be servants. He try, then tries out, he starts freaking out at this whole idea and remembers that the mongoose has mentioned to Ashok that yoga can be good for one's nerves if one's feeling a bit upset. So he tries out some yoga in his car and comes out of that to see that all the other servants are ridiculing him and laughing at him. And that's when he returns to the idea of the rooster coop and says that it's guarded from the inside and that servants work to destroy each other's dreams and desires. He then finishes his letter to Jabao rather suddenly, citing an emergency that has just come up. All right, so now I'm going to get on with reading uh, the text. Okay, so we're down now to the fifth night. All right, so the fifth, the fifth night follows the fourth night, which ended with Balram discussing his anger and rage at how he'd been treat, treated um, in terms of being framed and being sent, um, about to be sent to prison. So in the fifth night, um, it begins again, uh, addressing Mr. Jabao, Sir, when you get here, you'll be told we Indians invented everything from the internet to hard boiled eggs to spaceships before the British stole it all from us. Nonsense. The greatest thing to come out of this country in the 10,000 years of its history is the rooster coop. So this rooster coop is one of the most important concepts in the whole of this text and you've got to get your head around what it means. Go to Old Delhi behind the Jama Masjid and look at the way they keep chickens there in the market. Hundreds of pale hens and brightly coloured roosters stuffed tightly into wire mesh cages, packed as tightly as worms in a belly, pecking each other and shitting on each other. I should have highlighted that. It's one of my favourite quotes yeah, this, and it comes up again later in the chapter as well. Pecking each other and shitting on each other, jostling just for breathing space, the whole cage giving off a horrible stench, the stench of terrified feathered flesh. On the wooden table above this coop sits a grinning young butcher showing off the flesh and organs of a recently chopped up chicken. Still, do I really have to pronounce this word? Holy no. Nah. Can't do it. With a coating of dark blood, the roosters in the coop smell the blood from above. They see the organs of their brothers lying around them. They know they're next, yet they do not rebel. They do not try to get out of the coop. The very same thing is done with human beings in this country. Okay, so imagine a coop, chickens in it, they're being slaughtered, they can see it's happening to them. And all they do, they don't do anything to rebel, yet they do not rebel. They don't try to escape. All they do is just peck and shit all over each other um, and just sit there and let it happen. And the same thing is done to um, humans in this country. Watch the roads in the evenings in Delhi. Sooner or later, you'll see a man on a cycle rickshaw pedaling down the road with a giant bed or a table tied to the cart that is attached to his cycle. Every day furniture is delivered to people's homes by this man, the delivery man. A bed costs 5,000 rupees, maybe 6,000. Add the chairs and a coffee table and it's 10 or 15,000. A man comes on a cycle cart bringing you this bed, table and chairs. A poor man who may make 500 rupees a month. He unloads all this furniture for you and you give him the money in cash. A fat wad of cash the size of a brick. He puts it into his pocket, 
or in his shirt or in his underwear and cycles back to his boss and hands it over without touching a single rupee of it. A year's salary, two years' salary in his hands and he never takes a rupee of it. Every day on the roads of Delhi, some chauffeur is driving an empty car with a black suitcase sitting on the back seat. Inside the suitcase is a million, two million rupees, more money than that chauffeur will see in his lifetime. If he took the money, he could go to America, Australia, anywhere and start a new life. He could go inside the five-star hotels he has dreamed about all his life and only seen from the outside. He could take his family to Goa, uh, to England, yet he takes that black suitcase where his master wants. He puts it down where he is meant to and never touches a rupee. Why? So how is it that all of these incredibly poor people can be trusted with large amounts of money and they don't take it? And uh, Balram asks, what, is it because Indians are the world's most honest people, like the Prime Minister's booklet will inform you? No, it's because 99% of us are caught in the rooster coop, just like those poor guys in the poultry market. The rooster coop doesn't always work with minuscule sums of money. Don't test your chauffeur with a rupee coin or two. He may well steal that much but leave a million dollars in front of a servant and he won't touch a penny. Try it. Leave a black bag with a million dollars in a Mumbai taxi. The taxi driver will call the police and return the money by the day's end. I guarantee it. Whether the police will give it to you or not is another story, sir. Masters trust their servants with diamonds in this country. It's true. Every evening on the train out of Surat, where they run the world's biggest diamond cutting and polishing business, the servants of diamond merchants are carrying suitcases full of cut diamonds that they have to give to someone in Mumbai. Why doesn't that servant take the suitcase full of diamonds? He's no Gandhi. He's human. He's you and me. But he's in the rooster coop. The trustworthiness of servants is the basis of the entire Indian economy. The great Indian rooster coop. Do you have something like it in China um, too, Mr. Jabal? I doubt it, Mr. Jabal, or you wouldn't need the Communist Party to shoot people and a secret police to raid their houses at night and put them in jail like I've heard you have over there. Here in India, we have no dictatorship, no secret police. That's because we have the coup. So he's describing how two diff entirely different societies control their population. The Chinese system, um, there is a secret police and Communist Party, to control things, put them in jail, and here we have the rooster coop. Never before in human history have so few owed so much to so many, Mr. Jabal. A handful of men in this country have trained the remaining 99% as strong, as talented, as intelligent in every way to exist in perpetual servitude, a servitude so strong that you can put the key of his emancipation in a man's hand and he'll throw it back to you with a curse. And this word emancipation, it means, it means freedom. So if you're emancipated, you're free, okay? So different system. The Chinese system operates with force and the Indian system operates as kind of an ideological thing. Somehow the servants have been mentally trained not to steal. You'll have to come here and see it for yourself to believe it. Every day, millions wake up at dawn, stand in dirty, overcrowded buses, get off at their master's posh houses and then clean the floors, wash the dishes, weed the garden, feed their children, press their feet, all for a pittance. I will never envy the rich of America or England, Mr. Jabal. They, they have no servants there. They cannot even begin to understand what a good life is. Now, a thinking man like you, Mr. Premier, must ask two questions. Why does the rooster coop work? How does it trap so many millions of men and women so effectively? So I'm just going to get that trap. So millions of men and women so effectively. Secondly, can a man break out of the coop? What if one day, for instance, a driver took his employer's money and ran? What would his life be like? I will answer both questions for you, sir. The answer to the first question is that the pride and glory of our nation, 
the repository of all our love and sacrifice, the subject of no doubt considerable space in the pamphlet that the Prime Minister will hand over to you, the Indian family is the reason we are trapped and tied to the coop. Now, before we read on, why do you think the Indian family traps the servants in this system where they do their work, they don't question it, they don't disobey, they don't steal, they don't run away, they don't rebel. Why does the family hold them there? The answer to the second question, the second question being, can a man break out of the coop? The answer to the second question is that only a man who is prepared to see his family destroyed, hunted, beaten, burned alive by the masters, can break out of the coop. That would take no normal human being but a freak, a pervert of nature. These quotes here, really significant here, it would in fact take a white tiger. Remember the white tiger is a once in a generation, a, uh, a rare and unusual creature. So somebody who can pre is prepared to let all of this happen to their family, that is no normal human being, a freak, a pervert of nature. You are listening to the story of a social entrepreneur, sir. All right, now then he goes back to his story. So I just want to really reinforce the importance of the rooster coop and how it operates, that it keeps the servants in check. Yeah, so if it's really, really important, every essay you write, you should have something on the rooster coop in it and use those key quotes to show that you understand the concept and think about it in contrast to China. How does the Chinese government control its population? It uses the secret police, it uses force um, and so forth. The Indian economy, the Indian society, it controls its servants by um, uh, mentally controlling them, that they know that if they break the rules, um, that their family will be you know, paying the penalty for it. Okay, he goes back to his story. There's a sign in the National Zoo in New Delhi near the cage with the white tiger, which says, imagine yourself in the cage. When I saw that sign, I thought, I can do that. I can do that with no trouble at all for a whole day. So now he's, he's shifting back to how he felt after uh, he found out he was going to prison for Pinky Madam and uh, Pinky Madam's hit run. For a whole day, I was down there in my dingy room, my legs pulled up to my chest, sitting inside the mosquito net, too frightened to leave the room. No one asked me to drive the car. No one came down to see me. My life had been written away. Great quote there. I was to go to jail for a killing I had not done. I was in terror, and yet not once did the thought of running away cross my mind. Not once did the thought, I'll tell the judge the truth, cross my mind. I was trapped in the rooster coop. What would jail be like? That was all I could think about. What kinds of strategies would I follow to escape the big, hairy, dirty men I would find in there? I remembered a story from Murder Weekly in which a man sent to jail pretended, pretended to have AIDS so that no one would bugger him. Where was that copy of that magazine? If only I had it with me now, I could copy his exact words, his exact gestures. But if I said I had AIDS, would they assume I was a professional bugger and bugger me even more? I was trapped. Through the perforations of my net, I sat staring at the impressions of the anonymous hand that had applied the white plaster <coughs> to the walls of the room. Country mouse! The Tilligo lips had come to the threshold of my room. Your boss is ringing the bell like crazy. I put my head on the pillow. He came into the room and pressed his black face and pink lips against the net. Country mouse, are you ill? Is that typhoid, cholera, dengue? I shook my head. I'm fine. Good to hear that. With a big smile of his diseased lips, he left. I went up like a man to his hanging, up the stairs and into the apartment building, and then up the elevator to the 13th floor. The mongoose opened the door. There was no smile on his face this time, not a hint of what he had planned for me. You took your time coming. Father is here. He wants to have a word with you. My heart raced. The stork was here. He would save me. He wasn't useless like his two sons. He was an old-fashioned master. He knew he had to protect his servants. 
He was on the sofa with his pale legs stretched out. As soon as he saw me, his face broke open into a big smile, and I thought, he's smiling because he saved me. But the old landlord wasn't thinking of me at all. Oh no, he was thinking of things far more important than my life. He pointed to those two important things. Ah, Balram, my feet need a really good massage. It was a long trip by train. My hand shook as it turned on the hot water tap in the bathroom. The water hit the bottom of the bucket and splashed all over my legs, and when I looked down I saw that they were almost rattling. A trickle of urine was running down them, and I've highlighted this quote here because I think this this period, Balram, the way he's feeling here is he's absolutely terrified. And um, Adiga shows us that with, with, with this, this involuntary, you know, he's literally wetting himself um, in this situation. A minute later, a big smile on my face. I came to where the stork was sitting and placed the bucket of hot water near him. Put your feet in, sir. Oh, he said and closed his eyes. His lips parted and he began to make little moans, sir. And the sound of those moans drove me to press his feet harder and harder. My body began rocking as I did so and my head knocked the sides of his knees. The mongoose and Mr. Ashok were sitting in front of a TV screen playing a computer game together. The door to the bedroom opened and Pinky Madam came out. She had no makeup on and her face was a mess. Black skin under her eyes, lines on her forehead. The moment she saw me, she got excited. Have you people told the driver? The stork said nothing. Mr. Ashok and the mongoose kept playing the game. Has no one told him? What a fucking joke. He's the, only, he's the one who's going to jail, Mr. Ashok said. I suppose we should tell him. He looked at his brother, who kept his eyes on the TV screen. The mongoose said, fine. Mr. Ashok turned to me. We have a contact in the police. He's told us that no one has reported seeing the accident, so your help won't be needed, Balram. I felt such tremendous relief that I moved my hands abruptly and the bucket of warm water spilled over and then I scrambled to put the bucket upright. The stork opened his eyes, smacked me on the head with his hand and then closed his eyes. So I've highlighted that just because it's more more evidence of that, you know, violent physical abuse of, of servants. And the, this behaviour of the mongoose and Ashok on the previous page, um, you know, just their reluctance to to and lack of lack of interest in in um, explaining to him that he's off the hook is really quite telling as well. They really don't care about him at all. Pinky Madam watched. Her face changed. She ran into her room and slammed the door. So clearly, Pinky doesn't like this display either. She's appalled that they haven't told him. She hates the way that the stork has, has acted, and and is she's disgusted with the whole thing. Who would have thought, Mr. Jabal, that of this whole family, this lady with the short skirts would be the one with the conscience? The stork watched her go into her room and said, She's gone crazy, that woman, wanting to find the family of the child and give him compensation. Craziness. So with this, we know that it's not just Bowram that she's feeling a, a sense of responsibility for. It's also the child. As if it were, as if we were all murderers here. He looked sternly at Mr. Ashok. You need to control that wife of yours better, son, the way we do it in the village. Then he gave me a light tap on the head and said, The water's gone cold. I massaged his feet every morning for the next three days. One morning he had a little pain in his stomach, so the mongoose made me drive him down to Max, which is one of Delhi's most famous private hospitals. I stood outside and watched as the mongoose and the old man went inside the beautiful big glass building. I've highlighted that because here we have in this discussion of the hospital, if you're going to be talking about, you know, the men with the big bellies, men with the small bellies, the light and the dark, the two Indias, the India divided into rich and poor, you've got the two contrasting examples here of the rich hospitals with the big glass buildings uh, for the rich and you've got the hospital that Vikram died in um, earlier in the novel. Doctors walked in and out with long white coats and stethoscopes in their pockets. Remember, there was no doctor in Bikram's hospital. When I peeped in from outside, the hospital's lobby looked as clean as the inside of a five-star hotel. 
The day after the hospital trip, I drove the stork and the mongoose down. So there's no, this, this is here purely for, for the um, purposes of making that comparison. The day after the hospital trip, I drove the stork and the mongoose down to the railway station, bought them the snacks they would need for their trip home, waited for the train to leave, and then drove the car back, wiped it down, went to a nearby Hanuman temple to say a prayer of thanks, came back to my room and fell inside the mosquito net, dead tired. So I've highlighted this too. Remember, Hanuman is the god of servants, um, and Balram has this kind of, I guess, ambiguous response to religion. He um, doesn't entirely disbelieve in it, um, but he's a little sceptical at the same time. But interestingly, at this point, he hasn't yet broken out of the coop. So he's getting off the hook with uh, the Storks family, has has led, you know, in terms of uh, the him potentially go to prison, his response to that is to go and pray to the servant God to say thank you for getting the poor little servant out of trouble. So he hasn't broken with that mentality yet. And after that, he went into his room, fell inside the mosquito net, dead tired. When I woke up, someone was standing in my room, turning the lights on and off. It was Pinky Madam. Get ready, you're going to drive me. Yes, Madam, I said, rubbing my eyes. What time is it? She put a finger to her lips. I put on a shirt and then got the car out and drove it to the front of the building. She had a bag in her hand. Where to, I asked. It was two in the morning. She told me and I asked, Isn't Sir coming? Just drive. I drove her to the airport. I asked no questions. When she got out at the airport, she pushed a brown envelope into my window, then slammed her door and left. And that was how, Your Excellency, my employer's marriage came to an end. Other drivers have techniques to prolong the marriages of their masters. One of them told me that whenever the fighting got worse, he drove fast so they would get home quickly. Whenever they got romantic, he let the car slow down. If they were shouting at each other, he asked them for directions. If they were kissing, he turned the music up. I feel some part of the responsibility falls on me that their marriage broke up while I was the driver. The following morning, Mr. Ashok called me to his apartment. When I knocked on the door, he caught me by the collar of my shirt and pulled me inside. Why didn't you tell me, he said tightening his hold on the collar, almost choking me. Why didn't you wake me up at once? Sir, she said, she said. He grabbed me and pushed me against the balcony of the apartment. The landlord inside him wasn't dead after all. So here, this is 13 flights up, and he's pushing him against the balcony. Why did you drive her there, sister fucker? I turned my head behind me. I saw all the shiny towers and shopping malls of Gurugayon. Did you want to ruin my family's reputation? He pushed me harder against the balcony. My head and chest were over the edge now. as it, And if he pushed me even a bit more, I was in real danger of flying over. I gathered my legs and kicked him in the chest. He staggered back and hit the sliding glass door between the house and the balcony. I slid down against the edge of the balcony. He sat down against the glass door. The two of us were panting. So here we've got Balram being held over a balcony by Ashok. And, Ash and Balram does fight back in this situation. You can't blame me, sir, I shouted. I'd never heard of a woman leaving her husband for good. I mean, yes, on TV, but not in real life. I just did what she told me to do. A crow, a crow sat down on the balcony and cawed. Both of us turned and stared at it. Then his madness was over. He covered his face in his hands and began to sob. I ran down to my room. I got the mosquito net and sat on the bed. I got into the mosquito net and sat on the bed. I counted to ten to make sure he hadn't followed me. Then reaching under the bed, I took out the brown envelope and op opened it up. It was full of 100 rupee notes, 47 of them. I shoved the envelope under the bed. Now I think 47, that's 4,700 rupees. I think that's around 50, 50 odd dollars. I think, maybe a little bit more. So it's not a fortune, but it's a month's, more than a month's salary to Balram, who gets, I think, three and a half thousand a month. I shoved the envelope under the bed. Someone was coming towards my room. Four of the drivers walked in. Tell us all about it, country mouse. They took positions around me. Tell you what. Ah, oh, the gatekeeper spilled the beans. There are no secrets around here. 
You drove the woman somewhere at night and came back alone. Has she left him? I don't know what you're talking about. We know they've been fighting Country Mouse and you drove her somewhere at night. The airport? She's gone, isn't she? It's a divorce. Every rich man these days is divorcing his wife. These rich people. He shook his head. His lips curled up in scorn, exposing his reddish, rotting, palm decayed canines. No respect for God, for marriage, family, nothing. She just went out for some fresh air and I brought her back. The gatekeeper has gone blind. Loyal to the last. And this, he is loyal, Balron. He's, uh, he is loyal. He's keeping the secrets of his employers with the servants. They don't make servants like you anymore. I waited all morning for the bell to ring, but it did not. In the afternoon, I went up to the 13th floor and rang the bell and waited. He opened his door and his eyes were red. What is it? Nothing, sir. I came to make lunch. No need for that. I thought he was going to apologise for almost killing me, but he said nothing about it. Sir, you must eat. It's not good for your health to starve. Please, sir. With a sigh, he let me in. Now that she was gone, I knew that it was my duty to be like a wife to him. I had to make sure he ate well and slept well and did not get thin. I made lunch. I served him. I cleaned up. Then I went down and waited for the bell. At eight o'clock, I took the lift up again, pressing my ear against the door. I listened. Nothing, not a sound. I rang the bell. No response. I knew he couldn't be out. I was his driver, after all. Where could he go without me? The door was open. I walked in. He lay beneath the framed photo of the two Pomeranians, a bottle on the mahogany table in front of him. His eyes closed. I sniffed the bottle. Whiskey. Almost all of it gone. I put it to my lips and emptied the dregs. Sir, I said, but he did not wake up. I gave him a push. I slapped him on the face. He licked his lips, sucked his teeth. He was waking up, but I slapped him a second time anyway. A time-honoured servant's tradition, slapping the master when he's asleep, like jumping on pillows when masters are not around, or urinating into their plants, or beating or kicking their pet dogs. Innocent servant's pleasures. Compare this section here to um, what Bowen said at the beginning of the chapter about um, servants. They'll steal a rupee. One, They'll steal small things, but they won't take large things. So it doesn't mean that they're not, you know, angry with their situation. They will, if they can get away with it, do little things. But what they won't do is openly defy uh, the master. I dragged him into his bedroom, pulled the blanket over him, turned the lights off and went down. There was going to be no driving tonight. So I headed off to the Action English Liquor Store. My nose was still full of Mr. Ashok's whiskey. So he's gone off to the bottle shop to get himself something to drink. The same thing happened the next night too. The third night he was drunk but awake. Drive me, he said. Anywhere you want, to the malls, to the hotels, anywhere. Around and around the shiny malls and hotels of Gurugayan, I drove him. And he sat slouched in the back seat, not even talking on the phone for once. When a master's life is in chaos, so is the servant's. I thought, maybe he's sick of Delhi now. Will he go back to Darnbad? What happens to me then? My belly churned. I thought I would crap right there on the seat of the of the gearbox. If Ashok his you know, Ashok if Ashok falls apart or you know goes back home, Bowen's not potentially not going to have a job. Stop the car, he said. He opened the ca- door of the car and put his hand on his stomach, bent down and threw up on the ground. I wiped his mouth with my hand and helped him to sit down by the side of the road. The traffic roared past us. I patted his back. There's a lot of details here of how Bowen looks after Ashok, um, how how much he, you know, treats him like a family member. um, Or, you know, he says earlier, he's meant to be like a wife to him. It's very personal, the care that he gives him in this section. You're drinking too much, sir. Why do men drink Bowen? I don't know, sir. Of course, in your cast you don't. Let me tell you, Bowen, men drink because they are sick of life. I thought caste and religion didn't matter any longer in today's world. My father said, no, don't marry her. She's of another... I... Mr. Ashok turned his head to the side and I rubbed his back, thinking he might throw up again, but the spasm passed. Sometimes I wonder, Bowen, I wonder what's the point of living. I really wonder... The point of living? 
My heart pounded. The point of your living is that if you die, who's going to pay me three and a half thousand rupees a month? You must believe in God, sir. You must go on. My granny says that if you believe in God, then good things will happen. That's true. It's true. We must believe, he sobbed. Once there was a man who stopped believing in God, and you know what happened? What? His buffalo died at once. I see, he laughed. I see. Yes, sir, it really happened. The next day he said, God, I'm sorry, I believe in you, and guess what happened? His buffalo came back to life? Exactly. He laughed again. I told him another story, and this made him laugh some more. Has there ever been a master-servant relationship like this one? He was so powerless, so lost, and my heart just had to melt. Whatever anger I had against him for trying to pin Pinky Madam's hit-and-run killing on me passed away that evening. That was her fault. Mr. Ashok had nothing to do with it. I forgave him entirely. So I've just highlighted these quotes to show, you know, how he's beginning to feel that he's building a relationship with Ashok. I talked to him about the wisdom of my village. So this is kind of a little bit, um, he's being a little bit sarcastic here uh, because he's not, he's made, he makes things up as he did earlier with the, you know, pretending to, to pray and so forth. Um, half repeating things I remembered Granny saying and half making things up on the spot. And he nodded. It was a scene to put your mind, put in your, it was a scene to put you in mind of that passage in that Bhagavad Gita when our Lord Krishna, another of history's forgotten chauffeurs, drives the chariot he is driving and gives his passengers some excellent advice on life and death. Like Krishna, I philosophized, I joked, I even sang a song, all to make Mr. Ashok feel better. Baby, I thought, rubbing his back as he heaved and threw up one more time. You big, pathetic baby. So this is really complex, this discussion. Balram's is in two minds. He's kind of looking down on Ashok at the same time as he's becoming excited about their growing relationship. It is a very complicated, contradictory um, description of their relationship. And if you're going to discuss it, you should be really open about that and talk about the complexity of the relationship and about Barham's own confusion about his own feelings at this stage um, of, of, the, of the story. I put my hand out and wiped the vomit from his lips and cooed soothing words to him. It squeezed my heart to see him suffer like this. But where my genuine concern for him ended and where my self-interest began, I could not tell. No servant can ever tell what the motives of his heart are. And that's because the servants are so dependent on the masters. Do we loathe our masters behind a facade of love or do we love them behind a facade of loathing? We are made, we are, we are made mysteries to ourselves by the rooster coop we are locked in. So significant section there that you can use to discuss complexity here and also that Balram himself is not 100% sure how he feels. The next day I went to a roadside temple in Gurugayon. I put a rupee before the two resident pairs of divine asses and prayed that Pinky Madam and Mr. Ashok should be reunited and given a long and happy life together in Delhi. And remember that this praying he's doing, this is at his own, he's doing this himself. So it is evidence of of some you know religious feeling that he has and here he's trying to get these two guys back together so he's trying to help Ashok he's trying to be a good servant even after the uh, hit and run and I think that whole idea that Ashok could warm to him and really see him and want a relationship a friendship with him uh, is really spurring him on you know spurring his loyalty on even further a week passed like this, and then the mongoose turned up from Darnbad, and Mr. Ashok and I went together to the station to collect him. The moment he arrived, everything changed for me. So I've highlighted that. The intimacy was over between me and Mr. Ashok. Once again, I was only the driver. Once again, I was only the eavesdropper. So whatever he thinks he's built up with Ashok over this week is, is crushed the minute the mongoose arrives back. I spoke to her last night. She's not coming back to India. Her parents are happy with her decision. 
This can only end one way. Don't worry about it, Ashok. It's okay, and don't call her again. I'll handle it from darn bud. If she makes any noise about wanting your money, I'll just gently bring up that matter of the hit and run. See? It's not the money I'm worried about, Mukesh. I know, I know. The mongoose put his hand on Ashok's shoulder, just the way Kishin had put his hand on my shoulder so many times. We were driving past a slum, one of those series of makeshift tents where the workers at some construction site were living. The mongoose was saying something, but Mr. Ashok wasn't paying attention. He was looking out of the window. My eyes obeyed his eyes. I saw the silhouettes of the slum dwellers close to one another inside the tents. You could make out one family, a husband, a wife, a child, all huddled around a stove inside one tent lit up by a golden lamp. The intimacy seemed so complete, so crushingly complete. I understood what Mr. Ashok was going through. So what does he mean here? I understood what Mr. Ashok was going through. I don't know what he means there. Why Why have we got that scene with the family in the tent? And we've got the reference to um, Mukesh putting his arm around Ashok like Kishan put his arm around Balram. Uh, we've got... Um, the discussion earlier in the chapter of the rooster coop and the importance of the fact of the family, um, and the fact that Balram, as as it will go on, as Ashok will go on to explain here, Balram is not part of Ashok's family, um, and so he really doesn't count. When I was in America, I thought family was a burden. I don't deny it. When you and your father tried to stop me from marrying Pinky because she wasn't a Hindu, I was furious with you. I don't deny it. But without a family, a man is nothing, absolutely nothing. I had nothing but this driver in front of me for five nights. And now at last I have someone real by my side, you. So this is Ashok, who's an outsider to Indian culture, talking about the importance of family. And you can make that point using that quote, that even he realizes how important it is. Balram doesn't say how he's feeling here, but you can imagine, given the contrast between you know, how he was feeling, hearing, you know, believing that Ashok was coming to like him versus, you know, uh, nothing but this driver. At last I have someone real by my side. He must have been crushed by this. I went up to the apartment with them. The mongoose wanted me to make a meal for them and I made dal and chapatis and a dish of okra. I served them and then I cleaned the utensils and plates. During dinner, the mongoose said, if you're getting depressed, Ashok, why don't you try yoga and meditation? There's a yoga master on TV and he's very good. This is what he does every morning on his program. He closed his eyes, breathed in, and then exhaled slowly, saying, Om. When I came out of the kitchen, wiping my hands on the sides of my trousers, the mongoose said, Wait. He took a piece of paper out of his pocket and dangled it with a big grin, as if it were a prize for me. You have a letter from your granny. What is her name? He began to cut the letter open with a thick black finger. Kusum, sir. Remarkable woman, he said, and rubbed his forearms up and down. So he's copying Kusum's um, mannerisms there. I said, sir, don't bother yourself. I can read. He cut the letter open. He began reading it aloud. Mr. Ashok spoke in English, and I guessed what he said. Doesn't he have the right to read his own letters? And his brother replied in English, and again I guessed rather than understood his meaning. He won't mind a thing like this. He has no sense of privacy. In the villages, there are no separate rooms, so they just lie together at night and fuck like that. Trust me, he doesn't mind. So they really have really very um, negative views of, of the um, villages and, um, and see them almost as like being animals, I suppose, really. He turned so that the light was behind him and began to read aloud. This is from Granny Kusum. Dear grandson, this is being written by Mr. Krishna, the school teacher. He remembers you fondly and refers to you by your old nickname, the White Tiger. Life has become hard here. The rains have failed. Can you ask your employer for some money for your family and remember to send the money home? The mongoose put the, put the letter down. That's all these servants want. Money, money, money. They're called your servants, but they suck the lifeblood out of you, don't they? So um, just highlighted those quotes for 
you know, if you wanted to illustrate the landlords and their attitudes to the servants and um, that these would be good quotes to use and, and just how uh, ridiculous it is that the servants' situation is they're so impoverished, um, have so little power and yet, uh, and yet the attitude of people like the mongoose is that they are trying to suck the lifeblood out of the landlords, which is quite frankly ridiculous. He continued reading the letter. With your brother Kishin, I said, now is the time. And he did it. He married. With you, I do not order. You are different from all the others. You are deep like your mother. Even as a boy you were so, when you would stop near the pond and stare up at the black fort with your mouth open in the morning and evening and night. So I've, I've saved that quote because of the black fort and how we've previously talked about how what you know it represents you know, possibilities for betterment and you know better life and those sorts of things. And also I saved that you're deep like your mother because I think there's also... Um, some suggestion, even though his mother is not a you know a fleshed out character in the novel, there's some suggestion that she may also have had dreams and desires and so forth, and been a little bit like Balram uh, in her own way. So I do not order you to marry, but I tempt you with the joys of married life. It is good for the community. Every time there is a marriage, there is more rain in the village. The water buffalo will get fatter. It will give more milk. These are known facts. We are all so proud of you being in the city, but you must stop thinking only about yourself and think about us too. First, you must visit us and eat my chicken curry, your loving granny, Kusum. The mongoose was about to give me the letter, but Mr. Ashok took it from him and read it again. Sometimes they express themselves so movingly, these villagers, he said before flinging the letter onto the table for me to pick up. So again, there's that kind of idea of, of the exoticness of the villages being crafted for the consumption of you know, the landlords, that Kusum knows that this will be read by the landlords. And so it's written in a way that she feels is going to paint them as being kind of you know these quaint uh, villages with kind of backward, um, odd ideas. And so it won't be threatening in any sense to the landlords and will be pretty much what they're expecting of the villagers. And Balram adopts this same strategy in you know, various places um, in dealing with the, the landlords. In the morning, I drove the mongoose to the railway station and got him his favourite snack, the dosa, once again from which I removed the potatoes, flinging them on the tracks before handing it over to him. I got down onto the platform and waited. He chomped on the doser in his seat, sat down uh, down below on the tracks, and mouse nibbled on the discarded potatoes. I drove back to the apartment block. I took the lift to the 13th floor. The door was open. Sir, I shouted when I saw what was going on in the living room. Sir, this is madness. He had put his feet in a plastic bucket and was massaging them for himself. You should have told me I would have massaged you, I shouted, and reached down to his feet. He shrieked, No! I said, yes, sir, you must. I'm failing in my duty if I let you do it yourself, and forced my hands into the dirty water in the bucket and squeezed his feet. No! Mr. Ashok kicked the bucket, and the water spilled all over the floor. How stupid can you people get? He pointed to the door. Get out! Can you leave me alone for just five minutes in a day? Do you think you can manage that? The interesting little episode there you know you, you've got to think that Adiga intends us to see this bucket of water and the feet massaging as symbolic so here we, we've had the stork who loves to have his feet in a bucket of water being massaged by a servant here we have his son Ashok who's from who spent time overseas and you know is kind of flirting with the idea of being different from his his father he's massaging his own feet and when Balram comes in to, you know, he wants to re-establish the expected relationships between master and servant, and Ashok resists that, screaming and shouting at him to get out. But the way that he does it is still like a landlord. It's still in a kind of a dominant, um, very, very much uncaring kind of way. So, you know, it's like a lot of these symbol, symbols and, and so forth. There's no kind of straight reading of it, but it is interesting nevertheless. Um, and also Ashok's comment, how stupid can you people get? Um, you know, is he referring to that idea that the servants just kind of 
uh, you know, are willing to walk back into these master-servant relationships where they're thoroughly disadvantaged. Is he referring to that in that moment? I'm not really sure, and I don't, I'm not sure that it's really um, completely clear there. You've got to obviously make your own interpretations of the text. That evening I had to drive him to the mall again. I stayed inside the car after he got out. I did not mix with any of the other drivers. Even at night the construction work goes on in Gurugayon. Big lights shine down from towers and dust rises from pits. Scaffolding is being erected and men and animals, both shaken from their sleep and bleary and insomniac, go around and carry uh, around carrying concrete rubble or bricks. A man from one of these construction sites was leading an ass. And now an ass is a donkey, okay? It wore a bright red saddle and on this saddle were two metal troughs filled to the brim with rubble. Behind this ass, two smaller ones of the same colour were also saddled with metal troughs full of rubble. These smaller asses were walking slow, slower and the lead ass stopped often and turned to them in a way that made you think it was their mother. At once I knew what was troubling me. I did not want to obey Kusum. She was blackmailing me. I understood why she had sent the letter through to the mongoose. If I refused, she would blow the whistle on me, tell Mr Ashok I hadn't been sending money home. So you can see this letter from Kusum as a performance. Um, she, she's sending a message to Balram in front of his bosses. And you have to he, he's read between the lines what she means. And, you know, is now, I guess, explaining it to us now. Now, he's going to, this little section here, he's going to reflect on um, marriage and whether he wants to do that. Now, it had been a long time since I dipped my beak into anything, sir, and the pressure had built up. Remember that dipped his beak is a, is a, um, a way of talking about sex. The girl would be so young, 17 or 18, and you know what girls taste like at that age, like watermelons. Any diseases of body or mind get cured when, you're, when you penetrate a virgin. These are known facts. So again, this is more evidence for Bowram's kind of mixed consciousness. He's quite cluey in some areas, but in other areas he has really quite, un, um, quite odd um, ideas that we would uh, regard as being um, ridiculous. Uh, the idea that you can... You, you, um, uh, you know the, the the problems with mobile phones and his his outlook on homosexuality and and this as well they're, they're quite backward uh, ideas that he's expressing here and then there was the dowry that Kusum would screw out of the girl's family all that 24 karat gold all that cash fresh from the bank at least some of it I'd keep for myself all these were sound arguments in favor of marriage and you could even use something like sound arguments in favor of marriage as a quote if if the uh, urge struck you. Um, but on the other hand, see, I was like that ass now. And all I would do if I had children was teach them how to be asses like me and carry rubble around for the rich. I put my hands on the steering wheel and my fingers tightened into a strangling grip. So he's, he's thinking, if I get married, I'm going to have children. And then those children are just going to be servants like I am. So that's, and I'm just going to lead them into that in my current situation. The way that I rushed, had rushed to press Mr. Ashok's feet the moment I saw them, even though he hadn't asked me to. Why did I feel that I had to go close to his feet, touch them and press them and make them feel good? Why? Because the desire to be a servant had been bred into me, hammered into my skull, nail after nail, and poured into my blood, the way sewage and industrial poison are poured into Mother Ganga. I had a vision of his pale, stiff foot pushing through a fire. So remember, this is his mother's foot he's remembering here or having a vision of. And the idea that she was being... Remember that in, in the first chapter, how, how his mother's body almost seemed to be fighting the idea that the Ganga was... which represented the backward um, darkness of India, that it was going to swallow her up and suck her back in. And her foot, um, as she was being burnt on the banks of the river was almost trying to resist that fate so he at this moment he's got that image of of his mother and her being sucked into the ganga and, I, and he's imagining himself and then his children and the way that this is just going to happen perpetually over and over and over and over again and he says no no i said 
I pulled my feet up onto the seat, got into the lotus position and said om over and over again. How long I sat that evening in the car with my eyes closed and legs crossed like the Buddha, I don't know. But the jiggling and scratching noise made me open my eyes. All the other drivers had gathered around me. One of them was scratching the glass with his fingernails. Someone had seen me in the lotus position inside the locked car. They were gaping at me as if I was something in a zoo. And here's that motif of the zoo that's come up. You know, a motif, it's kind of like a symbol, but a symbol is more kind of directly related. One thing means another thing, whereas a motif can be like an idea that, that comes up repeatedly. And zoo comes up a lot uh, in this in this text. So, and remember the idea of him being a white tiger. Somewhere else in this chapter, we had him looking at the white tiger in the zoo. Um, so there's that kind of looking at uh, animals in captivity, whether you can visualize yourself being in captivity, all of those kinds of ideas are floating around um, in this chapter. I scrambled out of the lotus position at once. I put a big grin on my face. I got out of the car to a volley of thumps and blows and shrieks of laughter, all of which I meekly accepted while murmuring, just trying it out, yoga. They show it on TV all the time, don't they? The rooster coop was doing its work. Servants have to keep other servants from becoming innovators, experimenters or entrepreneurs. Yes, that's the sad truth, Mr Premier. The coop is guarded from the inside. Mr Premier, you must excuse me. The phone is ringing. I'll be back in a minute. Alas, I'll have to stop this story for a while. It's only 1.32 in the morning, but we'll have to break off here. Something has come up, sir. An emergency. I'll be back. Trust me. Now, this emergency is important, and we're going to come to this in the next couple of chapters. It's significant what stopped him uh, talking to Mr Jabao in this moment. But I just want to go back to this uh, thing about uh, the rooster coop doing its work. Servants have to keep other servants from becoming innovators, experimenters or entrepreneurs. That's the sad truth. The coop is guarded from the inside. This is similar to the family. Both other servants and the family both put fetters on the ability of other people uh, from the lower classes of India to be able to make any changes in their life. So the servants police uh, everything that's going on um, in India. Now, just going to finish up this chapter here. Just make a couple of points. This chapter is really about the rooster coop and it's about the impact of family, uh, both uh, Ashok's family and uh, relations within it and also Balram's family and how the family works to constrain people and keep them under control, but also Balram's kind of growing realisation that his family is uh, not there to help him but is in fact using him. And if he doesn't do something, he's going to end up creating children himself that will perpetuate and continue the situation for generations to come. He'll end up like the asses leading the other asses um, working for the rich. Okay, I'm going to finish up there. So uh, I hope that uh, hope that's of some use to you.